Okay, we're talking about the integrated rate law today. Um, and when we cover this, we're really gonna be focusing on just one reactant. If we have more than one reactant, actually things get very, very complicated. Um, we could do everything per each reactant, uh, but doing it all combined together actually gets, gets really crazy. So for the most part, well, for today, we're just gonna focus on one reactant system. So um, basically, here's, here's the big deal or a big idea, we have a rate law, right? And our rate law generally looks something like this. We have a rate as a function of some constant K times whatever that reactant is raised to some power. And that power depends on how uh, many of those A's are reacting in the slowest step of the reaction. But anytime we have a rate, we can integrate a rate and find um, a time. Uh, so the way we do that basically is uh, we do what we call the instantaneous rate law. So if the rate law, for example, is rate equaling k times a to the zero power, the zero power means this basically becomes one. So the rate is really just a function of whatever the k value is. And so if you turn the rate, instead of saying molarity per second, if you turn that into a change in concentration of a over time, the change in time, um, by calculus that change becomes d, right? Um, so we have D of the concentration of A over D time. Notice it's negative here because that uh, amount is going to disappear over time because we're doing it by reactants. If we had done the integrated rate law by products, all the numbers would be positive. But if we do it by reactants, that's going to reduce over time. And so if you multiply both sides by DT, you get the DA on the left and the DT on the right. And now we can actually integrate from zero to time um, over the course of that. And when you integrate the dA, you get A for time, or in other words, you get this, A for time minus A for time zero, um, which is the range from zero to time. That would equal, if you integrate K dT, you get KT. And so if I rearrange that equation, so if you just add A naught or A at time zero to the both sides, you get this form of the integrated rate law, which is in the form of y equals mx plus b, which means our y-intercept is the initial concentration of a, so I'll call that a naught, or a at time zero. And what's gonna happen to that concentration over time? Well, according to this, it's gonna have a negative slope where the slope is k over time. Oh, but that was a terrible, let me try that again. Right? Over time, until we get down to whatever our, I mean, we, we're going to run out completely, so, right? So we'd end up with zero at some point. So this is time, and this is going to be the concentration of A, where my y-intercept is the initial concentration. The slope here is going to equal negative K. And so this becomes really, really very useful because now I can time reactions and how fast they go. And if I know the starting concentration and an ending concentration, if I can measure it, then if I graph that relationship, the slope of that line is your rate law constant. So this makes it actually quite a bit more useful than the rate law because I don't have to run through 20 different trials to tr try to figure out what the order of the reaction is and then solve for K. I can actually just time a reaction, measure the initial and the final um, concentrations, and then I can find the slope. The problem with this is, is this assumes that it's a zero order rate law and there's only run one reactant. So if I have, if it's not a zero order reaction, then this graph would actually not be linear because we'd have, we wouldn't have this same um, relationship. We'd actually see a curve to it. And if it's curved, it must therefore not be zero order. So we would then move on to our next, which is what if it was a first order reaction, right? So the rate is equal to K times A to the first. Well, in this case, if I again, symbolize the rate as the instantaneous rate, dA over dt. It's negative because we're, we're losing concentration over time. But now that would equal, be equal to k times the concentration to the first power. If you rearrange, so divide both sides by a and then multiply by dt, so we get the a's on one side, dA over a, equaling negative kt, and we're going to integrate again from 0 to t. Well, if you integrate dA over a, that actually becomes the natural log. Um, so the natural log of t minus natural log of, I'm sorry, natural log of concentration at time t minus natural log of concentration at time zero, right, from zero to t. 
and then integrating from k date kdt would just give you kt negative kt and so then we can rearrange again and i'm we can we can say it like this or i can rearrange this and add it to both sides and we end up with that y equals mx plus b form as well where now we're going to be graphing the natural log of the concentration over time and here this would be my starting concentration, but the natural log of my starting concentration, so my y-intercept. And again, notice we're going to have a negative slope. So a negative slope where this line, the slope of that line, is negative k. Again. So again, very useful, because if it's a first-order equation, we'd get a curved relationship if we were to graph the concentration over time. And if we instead graph the natural log of the concentration over time, we'd get a straight line. And that straight line uh, means that we have a first order rate. And if it's first order rate, the slope of this line should be negative k. Now, what if that, that, that line, when we graph the natural log, is still curved? Well, that must mean that we, are, we do not have a first order reaction. Instead, we might have a second order reaction. So a second order reaction would be where the rate law would be, ten, be dependent on k times a to the second power. If it's a to the second power, again, we can symbolize the rate laws as, um, sorry, the instantaneous rate is dA over dt equaling um, ka squared. Again, it's negative because we're losing concentration. Again, if I divide both sides by a squared, we'd get this. If I divide, uh, multiply both sides by dt, we'd end up with the dA over a squared equals negative k dA k dt, integrate both sides. Integration from 0 to t of 1 of dA over a squared is from 1 over a. So a at time t minus 1 over a at time 0 equals kt. Notice, notice, we have this negative sign is actually gone now at this point. Um, so our y equals mx plus b form, if we add that to both sides, we end up with a positive slope for this one. Um, so that means when I graph the inverse of the concentrations, that means I'm going to start here at this initial inverse concentration at zero, and we're actually going to end up with a positive slope if we graph that over time, if we have a second order reaction. Where here, the slope of this line is equal to k, not negative k. So this is a slight or difference than what we've seen before. So. If it's a zero-order equation and we graph concentration versus time, we're going to get a straight line. If it's curved, let's try a first order. If it's um, natural log of A versus time, if we graph that and we get a straight line, it's first order. Our slope is negative k. If we get a curve again, we're going to assume that it's second order. We graph the inverse of the concentration. We get a straight line. Our slope is the k value. This is very, very, very useful um, in this process. Um, because now we can actually do based on times. So if we tried this problem here, for example, this problem says um, cyclopropane is an anesthetic. It's a first order reaction. So we already know that it's going to have that represent that natural log that we looked at before. Um, it tells us the rate constant. Ooh, that's great. So now we want to know what would the concentration be after a second? Well, that means if it's first order, we know it's going to obey the natural log rate law where the concentration at any particular time would be equal to negative kt plus the natural log of the starting concentration. So if I want to know the um, concentration after one second, I can just say that the natural log of whatever that concentration would be would be equal to, well, let's see, negative k, so negative 9.2 per second, times the time, we're going to do this at one second, plus the natural log of the initial concentration, which is six moles per liter. If you solve the natural log of that concentration after one second is going to just be equal to, let's say, nine, negative 9.2 times 1 is negative 9.2. The natural log of 6 is 1.79. And so add those together, you get negative 7.41 equals the natural log of the concentration of A at that particular time. Go E to both sides, um, and you should get the concentration of A at time 1 being 6.06 .06 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter. 
Okay. Uh, moving on. Oops. Moving on. We can also figure out the time it takes to get to a particular concentration. So um, this is pretty useful. This is actually would have been really useful in your lab if you could measure concentrations over time because um, would allow us to predict. Let's say we have a second order equation, so second order reaction for ammonium. The rate constant is 2 times 10 to the negative second. We want to know how long will it take for 10 molar ammonium to turn into 2 molar ammonium. Again, telling you that it's a second order reaction leads us to the 1 over AT equaling KT plus 1 over the initial concentration. Again, following that Y equals MX plus B format. So that means at time T, which is 2 seconds, our concentration would be 2 moles per liter. That would equal our K value, 2 times 10 to the negative second, uh, 1 over MS, times our time, plus 1 over our initial concentration of 10 moles per liter. Um, that's 0.5 equals 2 times 10 to the negative, whoops, second time plus 0.1. Solve for time, I got 20 seconds. So in 20 seconds, the concentration of the ammonium should drop from 10 to 2. Pretty useful stuff. Okay. Um, we can also do half-lives. So half-life is defined as the amount of time it takes for half the concentration to be present. So in other words, if we have, if X is our, um, is our substance, right, it would be the time it takes for half of the original concentration to be present. So um, let me show you a zero, a first, and a second order equation so you, we can see those as well. I only have first order written here. Um, but, but essentially, if we had a zero order, let's do, oh man, let's start a new page. If we had a zero order reaction, so for a zeroth order, we have a rate law that looks like this. The concentration of A is equal to negative KT plus the initial concentration. So what I'm saying is the half-life is the time it takes for there to be half as much there. So AT would be half of the initial concentration, right? at that particular time. We'd have negative K, and now I'm looking at the time one half, right? The time where half the concentration remains, and this is my starting concentration. If I get concentrations to both sides, I would subtract an A naught or an A zero from this, right? And so we'd end up with a half of the initial concentration minus the initial concentration gives us negative half of the initial concentration would equal negative KT. And so I can solve for the T one half by just simply dividing by negative K. We end up with our negatives canceling. So we end up with a naught over two K. So this would be the time it takes for half of the substance to be present. If I knew my amount that I started with and I knew the K value, I can calculate how much time it takes for half of it to be present. In a first order reaction, that process is very similar. We'd have the natural log of that time would equal negative KT plus the natural log of the initial concentration. Now, my natural log is going to be of one half of the initial concentration equaling negative KT plus the natural log of A naught. Well, I'm going fast here, I'm sorry. If I subtract the natural log of A to both sides, we'd get the natural log of one half a naught minus the natural log of a naught equaling negative kt. And if you're familiar with what happens when we subtract logarithms, that really means we divide uh, because logs are exponents. And when we um, divide exponents, we subtract them. So we'd end up with a natural log of one half a naught divided by a naught or the concentration at time zero, equally negative kT. Well, your A naughts cancel, right? And so we're left with just the natural log of one half, equally negative kT. And sorry, this is time at the uh, half-life. And so if you divide both sides by, um, so natural log of one half is really the um, negative natural log of two, 
but regardless, we end up with this equation. We end up with the natural log of 2 over k. So natural log of a, this is really, okay, I'll just stop there. Um, so what we see here is actually the half-life is independent of the initial concentrations. Um, for a first order reaction. It just depends on what the k value is. So whatever the k value is, take the natural log of 2 and divide by that value. That'll tell you the time when you'd have half as much remaining. I'll do it one more time for a second order reaction. So for a second order, it would look something like this. So we've got our inverse of the concentrations. Oh man, my computer is not keeping up. Here again, we'd have one half of the initial concentration equaling kt plus one over the initial concentration. Again, I subtract from both sides. Uh, we'd end up with, well, this is really, right, two over a naught minus one over a naught equaling kt. And two over a naught minus one over a naught tells you what? Well, that's just one over a naught equaling kt, divide by k, we end up with the time in which half is remaining as being 1 over k times a naught. Hopefully that makes some sort of sense. Um, again, if we know the concentration that we start with, multiply it by k, take the inverse of that, that'll be the time it takes to get to the halfway point. Okay, um, so we can do some calculations. And that, by the way, a first order and a second order are right here in B and C. I just wanted to prove them to you. Um, we can calculate the time it takes um, for half of it to remain with that same ammonia reaction, right? We had a first order reaction for ammonium, 10 moles per liter uh, starting amount, and I know my K value. What's the half-life? It's just a plug in and solve, right? The half-life is going to be equal to 1 over I'm sorry, the natural log, whoops, of 2 over k because this is a first order reaction. So natural log of 2 over my 3 times 10 to the negative third, uh, 1 over molarity seconds, should give me the amount of time it takes. So if it's natural log of 2 divided by 3 times 10 to the negative third, I got 231 seconds. Okay. Um, the lab that we're going to do when we get back from break is going to be basically number four. We're going to take some data of concentrations over time, and we're going to graph it. If that graph is uh, linear and the slope is negative, then that must be a zero-order process. If you graph it and it's curved, again, now we don't have a zero-order process. Now let's try the natural log of the concentration versus time. If you graph that and it's linear, then you know that it's a first order reaction. If it's not linear and it's got a curve to it, we know that it's probably not first order. Let's try graphing the inverse of the concentration versus time. If you graph that and you get a positive slope that is linear, we know that that's a second order reaction. If you get a curve for that as well, then we know something wrong <laughs> happened and we'll have to go back to the drawing board. It might be that we, um, had too many factors changing, and so therefore we're not measuring just one reactant, and so it's a combination of those two, and that might result in some weird results. But this is the basic process of the lab we're going to do when we get back from break. Okay?